Hello everyone, welcome to another live hangout here at Voice Essentials. So good to be spending the next uh, hour-ish, probably around about 50 minutes with you. Today we're going to be answering your questions. If you are watching this as a live, as a replay, not a live replay, could there be any such thing as a live replay? I don't think so. Uh, if you're watching this show as a replay, then uh, hello to you. It is always good to have you watch the show. In fact, you know, last week we had a guest, uh, Zach Bradford. He's an Aussie-based, in fact, Brisbane-based, the same city that I live in. Uh, a guest join us, and he he was fabulous. And it has been a really popular show. If you didn't catch last week's show, make sure you, after today's Q and A, go and have a, a search of it. Jump onto my channel, Doctor Dan's Voice Essentials. Have a watch of it. Zach was just so wonderful in his generosity of, of knowledge but you know it's the sign of a great singing teacher when they're able to explain things quite complex things in a rather simple accessible way and i think zach certainly did that which is a why, why i think so many people have been watching the live show so i highly recommend it to you yeah so if you're watching the show as a replay great to have you but of course so many of you have timed in for today's uh, live hangout. We do these live hangouts here every Monday, Australian Eastern Standard Time at 1 p.m. Today we're doing a Q&A. At this stage, next week we'll be doing a Q&A because I don't yet have a volunteer to join me for a live song review. Now, if you've never participated or, or seen us do a live song review what's involved is if you are a, an enrolled paying um, uh, student of the voice essentials online course and you can see the links scrolling down the bottom here if you are a, an enrolled student with that program as a value add you can come onto the show with me I'd love it if it was next week and we kind of do a, if you like, a live singing lesson. And the way we do that is I get you to record a song just onto a mobile device, <coughs> just as a, <coughs> excuse me, my lunch is catching up with me with a little bit of reflux. Um, we, we do, uh, we get you to record a song, we play it for everyone on the show. It doesn't have to be studio quality. We're literally talking about you recording yourself with your mobile device or some other device. And then we review it. And But not only review it, we unpack it. We, we do um, exercises that are designed to develop and improve um, the voice so that you really gain some personalized instruction, of course. The, the payoff of that is that we're doing it for everyone. They are amongst my most favorite live shows to do. So I would love to have a participant for next week. The details are in the description section of this video. You need to email me so I can shoot you off an email and response just to give you some more details. There is a little bit to it just from a technical standpoint, um, but it's all very doable and uh, and I don't think it would be too much of a stretch for most of you. So if you want to do that, you can. Now, of course, if we don't get a participant for, next, for that live show, uh, we will be doing another Q&A. The week following that, so in two weeks' time, we have another special guest, Kath Williams. Now, she's another Aussie local. She's from around about an hour and a half north of me in a place called the Sunshine Coast. And, uh, and Kath has a tremendous amount of experience in teaching um, young adult and adult learners. And I'm really looking forward to talking to her about her experiences and gleaning from her um, some of her expertise, which I just know you are going to find super helpful. So make sure you tune in then in two weeks time. And that's pretty much all the, all the housekeeping we've got to do today. Um, Hey, I want to just say thank you to those of you who chimed in to the Australian Voice Association webinar. Now, 
for those of you who don't know what who who the Australian Voice Association is or the AVA, um, it is a, a professional association. It's a conglomerate of uh, ear, nose, and throat doctors, laryngologists, speech pathologists, singing teachers, voice acting teachers physiotherapists who are interested in voice um, and uh, I just happen to be currently the national president and I will be the national president for another four or five months um, and we held a, a webinar with Professor Brian Gill from the US we held that on Saturday and um, it was it was outstanding it was amazing but I wanted to give a shout out to ones like Linda and Kathy Snyder uh, Beck, I see Beck Axe um, is in our chat today. Everyone who came on, uh, I know you'll have got so much out of it. If you are interested in that, um, we are going to be allowing people to sort of do a catch up on that. It is a, it's behind a paywall, so there would be some dollars um, for you to, to outlay, um, but it is a really high level, like, um, super high level. So if you're an absolute beginner, this webinar is not for you. Uh, a lot of it will go straight. Some of it went over my head and I'm going to have to do some catch up learning with some of the stuff that uh, Professor Gill went into around formants and harmonics and acoustics. Really cool stuff. Anyway, uh, and, and if, you, if you're paying attention, you'll note that we've actually had Professor Gill on this show, it would be over 12 months ago. Anyway, I, I hope to have him here again um, soon. But what we're going to do today is we're going to do Q&A. We're going to answer your questions. Well, to the best of our my ability, I'm going to answer your questions. I do not know at all, as I just revealed. With um, you know, with, there's just so much in this world of singing uh, that we continue to discover around voice and so if I don't know the answer to something I will be sure to let you know um, but equally I've gathered a few bits of information over the years of 25 years of teaching and 30 years I think of professional vocals so um, I'll be able to help us with answering with a few questions if you have a question you know to in the live chat leave it in the live chat Linda the wonderful Linda is gathers your questions she puts it into a document that I can see here. I see her. She's just put a question from Jessica Lim, just as an example. Has put She just put a question in there that Jessica's just asked. So we'll hopefully get to your question a bit later, Jessica. If you are absolutely desperate for your question to be answered, then the way to do that, we prioritize our, our the, the answering of questions. Everyone who puts in a super chat, that is, you can see... You can um, pay to have a um, to to pay for your question. So you can actually put a super chat in. I think I'm I'm actually looking at the bottom of my um, scrolling thing here, and I can't see the super chat availability. Anyway, if there is a super chat option there, um, you get priority because if you pay dollars, then you deserve to have your question answered. So make sure that you understand that, and then we then um, answer the other questions as we go. Um, oh, I did want to just say, I got a comment. Uh, we're getting two questions, everyone. But I did get a comment from someone in the live, vi live guest interview video that we did with Melissa Cross from Zenith Scream, which was last year. Fabulous interview if you want to see a great interview. But one of the, I got a comment this week um, in the comments section saying, why does Daniel, why does Dr. Dan look so distracted as, as, as if he's not interested? <laughs> I can assure you, I was very interested in what uh, Melissa Cross had to say and in what all of my guests have to say. But please, everyone, remember that I'm, I'm sort of hitting buttons here and having to sort of manage things. And as for those of you who tune in regularly enough, you would know that I often hit the wrong buttons or don't mute things or whatever. So I, I'm never disinterested in what's happening. I'm just multitasking and we all know what they say about men and multitasking. Uh, enough said about that. 
We're going to come back right after this and we're going to answer your questions. Okay. Now I'm pretty sure we don't have any. Can I just double check that we don't have any? I don't think we've got any music behind there. <laughs> Was it last week or the week before I had music playing in the background? And see what I mean? I'm, I get things wrong. Anywho, let's answer your questions. Uh, question one from Lachlan Boys Group How do I get a soft voice like The Weeknd? Um, well, uh, Lachlan Boys Group, the, the weekend, that sound is very much a, a kind of an alternate sort of R&B pop kind of sound. Um, and in fact, I had time to jump on and remind myself of, of the, the vocal quality um, that you were referring to. Um, because I actually don't listen to the weekend personally all the time. I've heard him before, but I had to jump on and listen. Anyway. The point being is that, that that lighter sound is more of a, what some people would refer to as a, a sort of a, a mix mode, leaning towards an upper register length and a dominant mode without it being uh, falsetto. Um, and so regardless of whether it's The weekend or other groups um, like him, I'm just going to turn my air conditioning on because I'm starting to get a little warm. I, get, I must be getting excited. Um, so. Uh, the weekend is, is apply. It, it all comes down to the, your ability to manage registration, and by registration we're talking about the four. And I follow for those of you um, playing at home. I follow uh, along with uh, the Thurman and Welch model of registration, which sees us with sort of four and a half types of registers. I'll explain the half in a second. Pulse, lower, upper, falsetto for men, flute for women. And the half is whistle tone. In fact, it's probably less, in fact, it is less than half of the population can actually create the vocal fold posture required to do whistle tone. So that aside, um, the four registers, I do go into this in great detail, um, Lachlan Boys Group, um, in a, a video on my channel, which you can jump across and have a look at. I think it's called Head, Chest and Mix. From memory, so it's quite. A, it's a longer video. I, as I said, I go into depth, and I also give you some in, some um, exercises to workshop it. I am of a, a, a great belief that there's great value in workshopping each of the registers, in a sense, separately, and then sort of tying those together. So it's about m being able to be mindful of where you are in your voice at any given moment, being able to mechanically and acoustically set the voice up to um, apply those registers and then it's the ability to manage and move between those registers um, and so someone like The Weeknd is applying what what for the most part sounds sort of like that really lengthen a dominant upper register without it being so light that it's lengthener only going into falsetto though he I, the voice does go into falsetto at times, um, and also the voice goes into, um, I hear him go into lower register as well. So, uh, But he's really using that as an aesthetic value, and so he's um, applying, and it becomes a signature, right? So singers become known for particular types of, of acoustic values, and, uh, and The weekend is using it um, like that. Um, I wonder. I'm just Linda. I'm just going to ask you. Can you can you send in the live chat, Linda, the 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 our Word document that we've got together? Can you let me know whether you can actually see the option for a super chat? It, I'm I'm not seeing it. I just don't want people to miss out on it if they want to do that. That's all. And so I'm just wondering whether you can see that or not, Linda. Just let me know. Um, okay, um, Kash. It's K-A-S-H is how they've spelt that. Hi, sir, I don't have a nasal voice, but still my tone sounds weird. What should I do? Um, well, uh, firstly, let's, let's 
Let's make sure that we don't set up nasal tone as the enemy. In fact, on the weekend, I was referring to the the activity that uh, sorry, the um, the webinar with uh, Professor Gill, Brian Gill, uh, and he was talking about nasality, and we we're talking about it more in regards to the the creation of um, the removal of Velaport and what have you, and um, not removal, the movement and the the closure and the opening. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I've just seen, I've just seen uh, Linda's answer to the question. The dollar sign is there for super chat on her screen. So if you want to super chat, you can. Um, what was I saying? Yes, in regards to that question. Um, so we don't want to set up nasality as being bad. It comes down to how much nasality there is. And so, you know, if I became overly nasalized because what I've really done is drop my my uh, my uh, soft palate really quite low so that all of my sound is really being directed through my nasal cavity. Now you can hear that there's a big difference between that and between that and that's because I'm adjusting where my sound is sitting. So a big part of nasality is is more about that soft palate shape. In fact, I mean exercise two in Voice Essentials one, my exercise collection, that's where we, we started working on this from literally exercise two. That's how important it is for you to be able to manage vocal track shapes. So by all means um, grab that if you if you need to or want to. And um, so when it comes to your sound sounding weird, of course there are two ways we hear ourselves. We hear ourselves um, directly through bone conduction um, and and as a result we we also hear ourselves uniquely to everyone else that's why we kind of sound weird to ourselves when we hear ourselves um, played back through a recording because we go oh that's I sound funny and and in fact actually what you're now hearing is what everyone else always hears and they don't think you're funny it's just that it's different for you so when we talk about our sound our tone sounding weird I guess the question would be, you know, we'd want to identify, are you referring to when you hear yourself as, you know, live in the moment or as a recording? Um, and so um, I would, I, you've asked what should you do, that's where you should go. I reckon you should go looking for a sense of um, more, you know, uh, vocal track shaping. And Voice Essentials 1, uh, exercise collection, as I said, really does get into that. So you can check that out in your own time. Matt, the ever-present Matt, has asked, "Can you get any of your high register back if you register back if you practice?" It would all. I mean, the the my kind of umbrella response to that Matt is yes, um, with a few caveats. It has to depend on why you you the the follow-up question to that is why is your re, higher register missing? Um, because uh, you, you know, by saying getting it back would suggest that once upon a time you had it and now you don't. So if it's um, if it's been missing for a long time, you know, uh, we'd want to identify why it has it been missing since puberty. We'd want to you know know that. So there's a whole range of sort of qualifying questions that we'd want to follow up on. But most certainly, um, all things being equal everyone should be able to access their upper register when their voice has been well balanced, is healthy, um, and, you know, has a whole range of, um, you know, skills at the ready. So, and as long as it's the voice is healthy, that's probably a key. Uh, Lorian Japan, I have a question. I'm glad you do. That's why we're here. Uh, I feel like a lot of air leaks out of my nose when I sing, what's going on and what can I do? Well, we kind of answered that question before, didn't we? Where we talk about air, air is going through your, your nose, it's coming through your mouth. Right now, I've got air, even though predominantly I'm speaking through my mouth and what some people might misinterpret as nasality, actually what's going on is, um, uh, twang. 
But nonetheless, there's a predominant, the predominant amount of mouth, uh, mouth, predominant amount of uh, air is flowing through my mouth, but there is still air going through my nasal cavity to a certain extent. And the thing about that is, air carries sound. If there is no air, there is no sound. And that's because sound travels on air, yeah? It's actually the disruption of sound molecules that causes us to interpret, our ears are able to then interpret sound. Um, I don't know if any of you can remember, there was a movie back in the, I want to say 80s, it might have been 90s, called, um, uh, I think it was called Anaconda. Um, and the tagline, the subline for that was, you can't scream if you can't breathe. And it was a bit of a sort of a think, think um, Sharknado. It kind of had that sort of, you know, corny horror sort of idea going on. And um, that, but that statement is actually very true. If you can't breathe, you can't scream. Did I say if you can't scream, you can't breathe? It's the other way around. If you can't breathe, you can't scream. Because if there's no airflow, there is no sound. And so it is important to understand that, you know, that's, that's umero numero important to understand. What I need you to also then think about, again, is how much is too much? Well, you then have to determine that based on what we get to hear you do or not do. And that would come down to quite personalized um, training, uh, Lorian. Uh, in lo oh, it's lorry in Japan. See, this is when people put these words together and Dr. Dan can't, at a glance, quickly, lorry in Japan. So um, that's what you want to do, want to be mindful of, is how much is too much. And um, we do, uh, and, and Brian Gill, again, I, I keep referencing um, this webinar on Saturday because it was so good. But in fact, I've got a, a, a video coming out in, um, I think I've got the video, it's either coming out the beginning of August or the beginning of October, where I uploaded it last week before Brian did all of his things, that tied in quite nicely. But when we talk about the difference between PTP, the phonatory threshold pressure, and PTF, phonatory threshold flow. And the big challenge, and this is where the coordination needs to go on with your breath management, is as contemporary singers, we are looking to reduce pressure and certainly keep it in a highly manageable zone, yeah, but maintain flow, and that's the key. And that's actually a hard balance to achieve. And, uh, and so that's really worth, um, worth being mindful of. I've seen Michelle um, Keeley's uh, super chat. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and she's asked, Hi, Dr. Dan, can you talk about placement and where the vocal focus is for lower and higher notes? Also, can you talk about Adele's voice and how she gets that sound and is it twang or nas nasality or both? Okay, let's break this down. We're only going to, um, well, very quickly, because uh, we're not going to do a breakdown of Adele's voice in, in total, but... What we tend to hear a bit in Adele's voice is some tongue root tension. It gives it a very distinct aesthetic, but I wonder whether it leads to some of the vocal challenges in part, not in total, don't send me emails. It may be part of what contributes to some of the challenges that she's had over the years is the larynx is under so much load because the tongue is gripping back a bit. So that's what you're hearing there a little bit. Um, there is some twang there. Um, there is almost certainly some nasality going on as well, but it's, it's the gripping of the rear of the tongue. That aside, because I certainly don't want any of us to hear me as dissing on Adele. She's an, an amazing performer, songwriter, and a fabulously sounding singer. We'd all just like her. I'd like... I'd love it if she was able to do it in a more sustainable way, but you know, there would be people that would argue against me on that, so that needs to be said. 
Let's talk about your first question. Can you talk about placement and where the vocal focus is for lower and higher notes? We can talk about that. Placement, let's first of all, let's recognize that placement is a very metaphorical term. There is, the voice does not place anywhere. It's simply the term that we singing teachers give to the idea of the, uh, or how we kind of try to describe our sensory awareness of the, of the sound as it travels along our vocal tract. Um, another gentleman that we've had here on the show before, Kenneth Bozeman, uh, describes it as the front room and the back room when we're talking about placement. So forward placement, and we look at this in Voice Essentials 1, Forward placement would be but a backward placement would sound like this. Now I'm using my tongue to change and move that placement. Back placement almost certainly has to be acknowledged as having a place because we don't, especially in contemporary voice, we don't rule anything out or label anything as good or bad, but it's likely, I think it's safe to say that back placement or back room um, position has, has less, finds itself being used less. And the big reason for that is because um, it's, it's far less sustainable. Uh, a voice that has the, the placement sitting back like that is more given to having a, a sense of back play, a back flow. And so the, the vocal folds are having to work against this acoustical overload and it's also contributing to reduction in flow. And so all of those things mount up and really cause the voice to work like crazy hard. And so um, that's where we want, I'm just searching for your question again here, Michelle. So that's where we want to get really careful um, about that sense of placement. Now, as the voice gets higher, you are going to find that the placement, that sense of forward placement that we want to maintain and sustain shifts. Yeah? I still remember, this is way back in my undergraduate years. In fact, this is probably back in my very first year at the Queensland Conservatory of Music. Complete, you know, noob when it came to learning to sing, let alone I hadn't even con contemplated the idea of being a singing teacher. Um, so I was only just being introduced to just this vast array of information and learning just about my own voice. And I was at the table in the cafeteria in fact, the Queensland Conservatorium in those days wasn't cool enough to have a cafeteria. I think it would be safe to call it just a common room. And one of the senior students, so he was a like a fourth or fourth year or honours year opera student. I cannot remember his name. And he was describing that sense in which, as you get higher, that you the the the, vo the placement has a sense that it shifts, and Anecdotally, my experience is that that's, that's actually the case. What we want to be careful of is that as we do climb higher, that the, the voice doesn't sort of flip right back, that we're managing that, that zone, if you will, of placement. And so that, allow, and that, that, that sort of moving of the placement will change as you go higher. And so that sensory awareness of your placement will shift as well. Um, so um, Shiloh, uh, oh, let me just double check that I've answered Michelle's question as best. I think that, I think so. So Shiloh Jen has also asked a question, how do you improve your storytelling story skills as a singer, which means a more effective delivery? What a great question, Shiloh. So what I would, the, I, I think it really comes down to some, some acting. It comes down to imagination. It comes down to creativity. Do you know what I encourage all of my performers to do? I, I encourage all of my performers to read 
fiction. Um, and the reason I do that, and it doesn't have to be any particular type of fiction, um, but what I'm encouraging the practice of reading fiction is because I want to teach and train your mind into creating the pictures and the landscapes and the, the whole aspect that will come out of a page into your mind as you read text. Because essentially, that is what you then have to do in your storytelling for your audience. You need to be able to present a canvas of picture to your audience. I think this is a, is a pretty strong truism. If you can't see the picture, your audience will never see the picture. And, and I've seen this time and time again. You know when we go to a performance and, and you, you hear a pretty voice, but, but it doesn't really connect with you. It just doesn't have any sort of, you know, doesn't grab you. More often than not, the reason being is despite the pretty voice, despite, you know, even, you know, it might be a voice that has all the, the trills and whistles, if, 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 they don't, if they're not able to convey, a com communicate a message, communicate a story, communicate a picture, and people think in pictures, then you, you're going to lose that sort of sense of connectivity. And so, Shala, I would encourage you to read fiction. And, I'm, and, and some people go, well, I don't really like to read. Well, I, I, I get that. What you might like to do is try audio books. What I don't want you to do is just watch movies. When we watch movies, Hollywood, you know, it could be Bollywood equally, it could be, could be any one of the, you know, um, movie production houses, they are doing all of the work for you. It's one of the reasons why we like to sit in front of the, you know, the veggie box and just, you know, because it's bright, we don't have to work for it. We're not exercising any imagination. But when we read, we get to exercise our imagination just by virtue of that's actually the task that is at play. Um, it's, do you know, it's, I've, I've read the entire um, seven or eight books of Game of Thrones. It was fabulous reading. But I decided to not watch the movies or the, 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 uh, the, the series that was put, um, put on TV. Uh, I know everyone did, but the reason I chose not to was partly because I started to read the books before the movies came out, and there is, there is a level of graphic violence. Um, there is some, some other, other parts to the stories, which are for a family show we won't mention. You get my point, that... I thought, you know what, my brain is able to censor and be far more appropriate to what I feel comfortable with than if I give that job to Hollywood. Hollywood are, are given to being far more uh, graphic um, on a whole range of areas and that played out actually, most from what I'm told. Uh, whereas when I read the book, my brain could could censor and and I found the reading far more enjoyable but that comes from years of you know here's a, a personal practice I read a chapter of fiction at least a chapter of fiction every night before I go to bed it's part of my sleep ritual um, but it's it's just a habit that I'm in and I am fairly confident it plays into my my ability to deliver and communicate pictures to my audience. So I hope that um, is helpful to you. JCM, I quit smoking a year ago. Awesome. And since then I've had dysphonia. How can I get my singing voice back? I the I would wonder so so firstly I I, I would struggle to conflate the two, 
Um, that being said, this is not my area of expertise. This is more a question for uh, laryngologists. They may have more information ready uh, for, you know, as to why that could be. I wonder whether they have happened at a similar time coincidentally. Um, that may or may not be the case. Um, as far as getting the singing voice back, um, if you've had dysphonia, I would be encouraging you to... Um, dysphonia is sort of a part voice loss, so for those of you who are watching, it could be a hoarseness, a, um, uh, you know, a, um, a breathiness, a huskiness, um, an intermittent sound. Um, I mean, it could be, it, depending on how long you've been smoking JCM prior to giving up, which again, fantastic that you've been able to do that. Um, you know, what we do know about the, the, for people who do quit smoking, when they do give up their, um, their smoking, the body then goes through a, um, a regeneration um, process, which can take quite some time, years. And a big part of that is, is the body starting to eject the tar and the gunk uh, that cigarettes have in, in, you know, that the body has ingested into the lungs. And so um, it may well be that um, the dysphonia has come about because of that. Um, I would be speaking to a laryngologist first and after that allow them to direct your pathway um, as to what the reasons for that dysphonia may or may not be. Uh, let me come down here. Jessica Lim, I have a question and it might sound silly. There are no silly questions, Jessica. No silly questions. We're all in this together. However, she writes, however. I'm not saying there are no silly questions, however. No, Jessica writes, however, I'm really confused about it. When I sing, should I exhale from mouth only or also through my nose? My voice still sounds a little bit, little bit nasal, uh, even after I open my soft palate, so I wonder what the problem is. Um, it may well be that you're misinterpreting nasality for twang. Uh, equally, again, I, I, this seems to be a bit of a theme today, doesn't it? Nasality is not wrong. For you to do an M, mm, do it now. Do it with me. I won't be able to tell if you are doing it or not, but mm, when you do an M, that is 100% nasalized. There is no, you feel vibration in your lips, but remember, for there to be sound, there must be airflow. Sound is traveling on the air, and there is no air coming through my mouth. Same with N. Mm, no sound through my, there is a, a reverberance, you know, where we're agitating air a little bit through the vibration of the N, but it's mostly through the, nas uh, through the nasal cavity. NG, mm, where the tongue is lifting up to the rear of the, uh, the, rear of the soft palate, completely 100% nasalized. So we can't fall into that trap of thinking that nasality is good, bad, or indifferent. Um, I think most languages on the planet, most dialects, employ nasalized consonants um, uh, like M, N's, N, G's, and in your dialect, it's in other people's dialects, it's probably a bit different. Um, yeah, so uh, don't get too concerned about it. You know, um, I know, I know you'll see people on YouTube all the time, you know, bemoaning nasality and, you know, there are, you know, it's a funny thing because we, we constantly see artists, famous artists, who are celebrated for what is often incredibly unique sounds that might be overly nasal or overly twang or overly tongue root tension with, you know, someone like Adele. And yet they're celebrated for the uniqueness of that sound, right? As they should. But yet then we struggle to, to allow ourselves that uniqueness and that 
and celebrate you know the individuality that those tonalities may present our voice with you know if you think of a Kristen Chenoweth and she's a, a, very, a, a sort of a, a quite a famous Broadway singer who went on to do movies and what have you uh, wonderful you know now now I guarantee you you know I'm just putting it out there if Kristen Chenoweth was not Kristen Chenoweth she was just you know your garden variety you know person who decided to put a, a song up on YouTube she was not famous not known by anyone she would be slammed for her nasality and, and yet it the sound would be wonderful and so you know be careful not to take on board what others are saying about your sound you know if if you have a in my case you know I've shared this many times on the show um, my nickname at high school was squeak at some point I don't know when this point was but at some point I chose to lean in to that to not you know for for so many years I I ran from it I was like oh, I'm you know because it was kind of a, a nasty thing it was meant to be it was I think it was probably meant to be endearing but I took it to be quite I you know I took a hit from it I took multiple hits hits from it but at some point I went actually no this this is what makes my voice unique in fact this is what makes my voice at times sound exciting this is what makes people sit up and listen to my sound and so when I was able to go do you know what the very thing that I've thought was my weakest part of my voice and I started to go actually that can be my strength that can be my my standout point that can really serve my money notes then then it got exciting for me and I encourage you to do the same uh, Jessica and everyone uh, Alex um, oh oh wow oh wow I'm just I just I hadn't scrolled down <laughs> this the the questions everyone we are not going to get to everyone's questions we, we're just it is just simply not going to happen this is why the super chat if you want your question answered you've got to ask it as a super chat because we are going to finish in five minutes because I've got to go and teach um, a student uh, so anyway if you've asked a question um, because we're right like up to question 22 or something and I'm only back up here at I don't know question uh, where am I question 7 um, how to know this is Alex uh, how to know my voice is good enough but everyone told me it is good not good but I don't have the confidence well maybe just what I've just said um, Alex is is sometimes we have to trust you know this is hard for many people um, we have to trust that what is being said to us what is being fed back to us by people that it is true you know shows like we're, we're having here in Australia at the moment we're having um, American Idol advertised on TV and um, I haven't watched a, an episode of Idol whether it be Australian Idol or American Idol for decades but anyway um, so I don't know whether this is still true but certainly back in the day when I used to watch it you know they'd make fun of they'd actually get select people um, the producers would identify different people that you know were quite obviously very early in their vocal development journey um, and and then you know make fun of them and um, highlight them as being you know uh, you know having this really whacked thought self assessment of their own voice what many of you may not know um, and this has been played out and, and described by many people is that in fact um, you know th those same people that, that are being made fun of the producing team have often said to them you know we think you're great you need to come on so so they're receiving they're receiving a misinformation and and it's that sort of behavior that builds a society of mistrust um, but if you are surrounded by people who love you 
who only want the best for you, who you have over a period of time learnt to trust. And if they're saying to you, hey, you sound great, then, then you need to take that on board. Now, what you don't want to mishear that as being is, you sound great and you shouldn't change a single thing about what you're doing. The moment you do that, the game's up because that's, that's putting a, a barrier to your growth. No matter how good you are, at any given moment, you can improve. There are areas in my voice that, that I can improve in. There are definitely areas in your voice that you can improve in also. Um, but, you know, the feedback can still be true that you could sound great. And so then you have to develop and nurture and culture that, that, um, that confidence. Um, I do know that the feedback I get from my private students is that in the first 12 months of lessons with me privately, um, the feedback I constantly get from people is the number one thing that they've gained from our lessons together has been the fact that they have developed confidence. They, I, I like to know, it is good to know that they develop a whole range of other things, but the number one thing that everyone always says is I feel more confident. I feel far more confident in the use of my voice and in who I am. Linda, we're going to have to draw a line under it because I've seen one more super chat and it is going to have to be our final question for the day. Um, so uh, I'm sorry to everyone, questions, questions, what is it, question 8 through to 22. We are not going to get to your questions today, but tune in next week because we'll continue to answer them. Um, oh, by the way, if you do want to tune in, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the the white bell notification button because that's the way you get reminded that we're going live. Even though you just have to remember that no matter where you are in the world, about 45 minutes ago, we do it every every time the same week. Every week the same time. Last question. Does cold drinks affect your singing negatively? Um, really intuitive question. Do you know what? Uh, I think... My my own visceral response, my own kinesthetic response, is that if I drink an overly cold, like an ice cold drink, I do feel a sense of muscular response, which is a contraction um, from that, because your um, esophagus, the pipe that your food goes down, it sits, sits directly between your trachea, which is where your vocal folds sit in the larynx, and, uh, and your spine. So it's sitting between. Your food pipe sits between, in behind the larynx. And so when we drink an overly cold drink, so something that is you know down in the four degrees, five degrees place, which is basically the, you know, the, uh, the I'm talking Celsius here, that's the temperature of you know your, your fridge, uh, your refrigerator. Um, when you do that, um, that is significantly different to your body temperature, which is between 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. And so we have to be aware of that. Um, and, and that our body is going to have a, a sense of a, a bit of a response to that. I've also noticed that I get a little bit of a similar response to like a overly hot drink. Um, not as much for me. Now, what I would encourage you to do, um, su su Suave Chris, I think that's how you'd say it, Suave Chris, one Suave Chris, is play around with it. See what you experience. What we know about the voice and the humans that um, that in case that voice is we are all individuals and our, our morphologies, our anatomies, our biological setups are all unique and therefore we will all experience it differently. Um, and so you might want to um, play around with that. Personally, I generally instruct people to avoid ice cold drinks when they're singing always go looking for a room temperature 
water. And I've shared before, for example, if I were on my way to doing a gig and I had forgotten my water bottle, this has happened, forgot my water bottle, so I need to grab a water bottle, something, you know, then I will often ask the, um, the, the person behind the counter, can I, instead of, can you, instead of me getting a, a water bottle from the fridge, can you please go out to the back of the store, grab me a, you know, just one off the shelf that hasn't been refrigerated yet. And I find that is, is particularly, um, particularly helpful. So I think that's, that's, that's a wrap, people. That is a wrap. I, I hope you've ha enjoyed today's show. We've certainly had a lot of, a lot of questions coming in. Um, and uh, I hope it's been beneficial to you. Um, as I said, I would love to do a live song review show next week. To participate in that, you do have to be a, uh, a, a paid enrolled participant in the online course, which is, you can see, oh, where's it? Oh, oh. <laughs> it's coming down the bottom of the screen. Um, you can jump over that over there and check out the online course if you like. Um, we'd, I'd love to do that next week. If not, we will be doing another Q and A, and so don't hesitate to jump in. And um, if you like, if you've enjoyed today's show, hit the thumbs up button, share it far and wide, um, and uh, and I hope you all have an awesome week and stay safe uh, during these what are pretty challenging times for a lot of people. I look forward to seeing you next week. I'll see you again soon. I'm Dr. Dan. Sing.